Good afternoon. I'm, I'm pleased to see most of you back. Um, this is not for everyone. It's not everyone can take it. You always lose a few during the break. I am, as you heard from the Institute for Futures Research at Stellenbosch University, we were the first and remain the only such institute on the African continent, only one of us, where you can do a postgraduate program in future studies. There are about 16 of these around the world. And also, most of our work actually is advisory work. And what, what I'll share with you is just a few thoughts on the idea of thinking and the way that artists might help us to do so. We hear all the time that what we need is new thinking, but what does this mean? So you go on a course and you're encouraged to think differently. So it's Monday morning and there you are at your computer. You think, new thinking, new thinking, okay. What is this? So you get a mail from your boss and you have to attend a meeting. You think, well, what, I normally go to these meetings, so what would new thinking look like? As it turns out, there's a real science behind this, and essentially this is what we study at the Institute for Futures Research. We study long-term thinking. How thinking about the future changes the way that we think. And what I'll talk about today is some of my recent work on how the way that artists think might in fact help us to do so. So that's essentially what we study, long-term thinking, or in the absence of thinking, long-term stupidity. Now, could we learn anything from artists? Well, one of the things you learn from artists is that they are in fact creative and they produce things almost as if by magic, so I'm going to try and do a similar thing. In order to click to the next slide, I'm going to put the clicker down here, and when I point with my hand, it will go to the next slide. Let's just see if that works. It does work, okay, fantastic. I'm gonna try that again, pushing my luck here a little bit, fantastic. So this model first appeared in a book that was published by Stellenbosch University just this year called Forward. The university commissioned 100 artists to produce works on the future of higher education in the next century. And we got the most fantastic array of artists to collaborate and the Institute for Futures Research produced the texts that accompanied these amazing works. And the framework today is in support of that work. Um, so it turns out thinking is not so simple. It's a little bit, yes, dare I say it, a little bit of an art form. And it turns out what you do with your brain has an amazing impact on the quality of your thinking. Now, as many of you know, you know that you've made it in the academic world if you can take your discipline and divide it into three parts. This is the ultimate achievement for an academic. And I've, I've, I've uh, sufficiently achieved this. I've, I've gone for the three-legged version. Some people like triangles. There's also the tripod option. Um, in my three-legged version, um, you're, you, you, can, you can change your thinking by doing essentially three things. You can either change the content of your thinking, that is, what are you thinking about? The most terrifying question for men. You can change the method of your thinking. So as opposed to thinking like a classical analyst, for example, how might an artist go about doing things? And you can change the level of your thinking. So rather than just thinking at the level of tasks or processes, what about thinking about the level of the planet? Those are three options then that you can use. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the method there, but you'll see it overlaps a little bit. So here's a, a work of art. This is, uh, this is Raphael, this is in the Vatican. And this is from uh, just, just, uh, just at the beginning of the 1500s. And Raphael, together with Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, formed these, uh, the three sort of fathers of the, uh, the Italian school of, of the Renaissance. And captured in this amazing painting um, are poets, uh, the legal guys, philosophers, um, musicians, and the muses who really inspire alternative thinking. It's on, set on Mount Parnassus, the sort of um, location of the goddesses of creativity, innovation, and new things. So does that help us at all uh, by examining this artwork? Does it do anything for the way that we think? 
the method of our thinking, the level of our thinking, and the content of our thinking. Well, let, let's look at another one here. Here is, um, this is the, the Dutch school. Um, this is Rembrandt. I read an interesting uh, statistic the other day. Um, apparently, of the 700 paintings that Rembrandt produced, 3,000 are still in existence. Explain to him. You can see thinking takes a bit of speed sometimes, um, and, and both kinds. So, so this, is, um, this is Rembrandt's Minerva. Minerva is the, the goddess of, um, of a few things. Um, I'd imagine this is the, the sort of what you're aiming for as a goddess. You want to have a, a, a few things you're the goddess of. Uh, among other things, um, she's the goddess of creativity. And so innovation and artistry, but at the same time, she's the goddess of war. And these two things, what Rembrandt illustrates in this painting, is that these two things are contradictory. Because what he illustrates is what Minerva is up to here, is she's reflecting. You can see that as a technique artists started using um, around the 1600s, that you look outside the painting. Can you see she's doing that? It's sort of the, um, yeah, it's not quite the selfie, but it's, it's um, before the 1600s, you were just looking in the same room and the, the artists would just paint what's in the room. Then they got this amazing idea. Apparently, there's a thing called the outside. So why don't we get this person, it's not a person, it's a goddess, to look outside. Now, what she's doing is she's, she's reading, she's studying, and she's reflecting, looking out of the window. But here's the important thing, the important uh, symbolism here, is that in the background, it doesn't reflect well in the slide, are the sort of uh, tools of war a helmet and a spear. And the idea is that these tools of war are laid to rest, and only when that happens can artistry flourish. Only when we're not at war can we be creative. So we think about the South African context today and the longer-term future of South Africa, and we wonder to what extent are we at war, perhaps with ourselves, and to what extent is that preventing us from allowing artistry to flourish? And if we created more space, as this amazing conference is doing, for those who are curious about how artists think, perhaps more solutions may be sparked. I'd be very surprised if there's anyone in the room who hasn't already got a thought of what they might do when they leave here. And so you can see that when you lay down the weaponry, the artistry flourishes. Um, as many of you know, it's a legal requirement for consultants to have a, a two by two matrix in every presentation, um, just so that I can uh, remain legal. So, so one of the ways we study time, time is one of those really fascinating things. It turns out that w we don't know a hell of a lot about time. Um, uh, I mean, my wife often says it's about time, but um, it turns out it's a bit of a vague subject. I mean, let's do a sort of practical, uh, practical exercise. Let's imagine that you, you get an email and uh, you, you're invited to a, a meeting on Wednesday, next Wednesday. And then you get another email that says, the meeting's been moved forward by two days. On which day is the meeting now? How many of you feel this is on Monday? Anyone feel this is on Friday? The rest of you are not going to this meeting? <laughs> well, what can we deduce from this in-depth experiment as scientists of the future? What can we learn from this? Well, the one thing we can learn is that our idea of time is not universal. We treat time in very different ways. We're very curious about how different nationalities treat time differently, and the weight, the intellectual energy they provide when they invest on three simple, very, very simple time periods, the past, the present, and the future. How much of your time do you spend thinking about the past? How much in the present? How much in the future? And it turns out nationalities are not universal there. I was in Finland recently. Finland, for example, has an act of parliament that compels the central government to gather futures data from the provinces at least annually. They have a parliamentary committee for the future. Children in primary school learn futures thinking. 
I do an awful lot of work in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Jordan, Kuwait, and so on. Dubai, for example, has a minister of the future. Now, fast forward here to the southern tip of Africa. What informs most of your Bri conversation? Is it where it's going? Or is it how to make sense of where it's been? Well, um, enter the, di the directional thinking framework. This is important when you name your framework. It needs two words and then the framework at the end. Um, you've got to have one of your discipline words in the name of the framework. Preferably in the middle, it creates central focus. Directional thinking framework. Um, in our world, your surname comes first and then your first name and then the year honored enough to have experienced your brilliance. So, um, <laughs> what, what we'll do here, and um, with, with my magic hand clicker, we're, we're going to have to, we have to move a little bit, but um, what, would, what, what, what you, I've done here is that this is for the accountants, for the accountants in the room. Uh, the model has essentially been designed as a framework of creativity for accountants. So the first step to calming down the accountants is create a spreadsheet. So there it is. I hope you have a sense of zen-like calm about you. No fluffy artistry, don't worry, it's all very structured, calm and procedural. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is on this axis over here, I'm going to look at you. We're going to think about how your thinking shifts in relation to yourself and on this axis over there, wow, this is good. Um, we're going to look at we're going to look at how your thinking shifts in relation to time. Okay, so for the slow ones, this one's you, that one's time. Okay, you ready? So that first block there. What you're doing there when you're engaging with a piece of artwork is you're going inward. Yeah, you're thinking about yourself. We're in the era of the selfie after all. Uh, 20 years ago, you'd take pictures of other people on holiday. Now, I'm on holiday now. This is my time. So, so here you go inward and in relation to yourself and you go backward in relation to time. So think about what's going on there. When you go inward, it's all emotional. You have feelings. Um, for the accountants, just Google it. Just feelings and it'll explain everything you need to know. It's really about where you think you come from and the way we were and what it used to be like and your inner world. It's a, it's a sort of Oprah kind of space. Yeah? Um, you can perhaps imagine that we're not all that interested as futurists in what's going on there. There are psychologists for that sort of stuff. Yeah? Coaches, leadership type people um, who encourage you to do things like look inside yourself. Ever, ever heard that advice? We find that really bizarre. Uh, that you, I blame Oprah exclusively for this. Uh, you should look inside yourself. It's a, it's a very odd thing. Lots of movies are written based on this idea. At the end of the movie, she realizes it was inside herself all the time. Who knew? Okay, so I'm sure there is all sorts of stuff inside you. That's just not the stuff we're interested in. So however you might feel, and however special you think it is where you come from, we don't care. You may also have advice in a similar vein, things like, you know, believe in yourself. Have you heard that one? This is a really bad idea. Um, and we strongly advise against this. And there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's just an intellectual reason for this. Let me give you a multiple choice question here. You've heard this thing about it starts with you. L let me give you the multiple choice question. With which one of the following options is it most likely to start? Option A, you. Option B, any one of the other 7.2 billion. Which one is more probable? So we distinctly advise against looking inside yourself, and if you can avoid it, stop believing in yourself. 
and where you come from. Fascinating as you think that is, I mean, our, our view is that, that those who know where they come from also know where they've been. <laughs> we sometimes hear the theory that apparently those who know where they come from know where they're going. But there's almost no scientific evidence of this. It would suggest that the best futurists in the world are in fact historians. There's just no evidence of that. Okay. What you can then do, if you're still obsessed with yourself, is um, you could think not just backward, but you can think about today. What's going on today? What's going on in my life? How are things working? And you can particularly think about power structures, who's controlling me. This is a popular one for millennials. It's all about me and who's controlling me and why that should be disallowed because of my unique special personality and sparkling characteristics. So, so here you're thinking about yourself and you're thinking about what's going on today. You've, oh, you're over your past now. You've moved on. And you're just thinking about what's happening today. What's going on around me? Yeah? At least you're paying attention. What's going on? But it's still a little bit about you. The next one there is, where are you going? Now we start getting interested. Where's this going? So I'm really fascinating story about where you come from and the noise of the day. But where's this going? Yeah. So you think about, let's say, the orange, orange man in the, in the United States. A very strong sense of self-belief, right? Here is a man that looked deep inside himself. Believes in himself. What is his proposal? His proposal is, I, very much me, I'm going to make America great again. Like when? Like when black people couldn't vote? Or woman couldn't vote? What's your plan here? Yeah? We're interested in where are you going with this? Yeah? Where's this going? So if you look at the next one there, um, if you can move beyond how special you are, you can perhaps transcend that uh, in relation to yourself by, in a sense, rebelling against that previous self. Many people go through this kind of change. I used to be like this, and then I realized. You noticed on Facebook that people realize basically what happens to them. They don't realize it beforehand. So, for example, when you get the job, then at least there is still some meritocracy in the world. If you don't get the job, it's all political. Right? Have you noticed? So here, you're looking outside yourself a little bit. Now you can go down that little path as well. So you can look in a wayward way to your past, resent it, overcome it, disagree with it, transcend it. You could look in a rebellious kind of way at what's going on today. You know, this is a popular thing for a lot of people. I object. Thank you. We've noticed your objection. Oh, and what's more, I'm offended. That is your right. You are perfectly within your rights to be offended, and I am perfectly within my rights not to care that you are offended. <laughs> We're a little bit more interested in, in, if you're rebellious, where are you going with this rebellion, right? So if fees must fall, what must rise? And that's, the, that's a very delicate pe issue for a lot of people to deal with, that protest very seldom produces anything except protest. The ROI on protest is either negative or positive protest. It's a little bit like, um, let's play with the brain a little bit. Let's do a little exercise. You don't have to, but if you don't, you're not going to get what I'm saying. Let's do, those of you who want to play along, just, just do so. Just where you're sitting, just close your eyes for a second. Close your eyes for a second. And what I'd like you to do is imagine, just imagine, you've seen these white taxis we have in South Africa, just imagine, create an image in your mind of not a white taxi. And then open your eyes and tell me what you think you saw. Some of you may have seen. What did you see, madam? Is there a white taxi anywhere in there? There was. 
Okay, but did I not explicitly protest against the use of white taxis? Isn't it amazing what the mind does? The more you oppose the idea, the more the mind organizes itself around it. So what's the alternative? Well, one alternative, let's do that exercise again. Close your eyes a little bit again. Now what I'd like you to imagine is a shiny red Porsche. Shiny red Porsche and open your eyes. If you saw a white taxi now, you need help, right? The kind of help that I cannot provide. What's the difference between the two? Well, in the first one, you were seriously oppositional to the state of play. And in the second one, we were talking about, let's produce what we want. And it turns out the mind is very skilled at both of those. You have to decide what you want to do. If we move on just a little bit, and I'm almost done, and we move outward, we get really excited now because you can move outward in terms of your, your history, if you like. In a sense, how might you transcend it so that it doesn't capture you? You can move outward in terms of power structures, and very importantly, you can move outward in terms of what it is you'd like the future to look like. We call it the Cremora Principle. For the young people in the room, in the 1980s, You remember the guy at the fridge looking for the milk, obviously a slow learner, consultant advisors from the bedroom. It's not inside. So we're curious about how you look outside and how you use that insight to produce what's possible. I'll leave you with the words of the Hollywood comedian George Burns who famously said, I look to the future because that's where I'm going to spend rather a large part of the rest of my life. You've been lovely. Thank you. <laughs>